Welcome to Property Pundits. I'm Chris Bates and today I'm joined by Nick Viner. How are you doing, mate? Very well, thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me here. No, pleasure. Thank you. Um, so, Nick, uh, tell us a bit more about where you're a buyer's agent, what area you specialise in and how long you've been doing it for. Yeah, sure. So, I'm the principal of Buyer's Domain. Uh, my office is based in Leichhardt in Sydney's inner west. Uh, I've been a buyer's agent now for 10 years, believe it or not. So, yep. one of the more established buyer's agents floating around, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I actually used to be a property solicitor before becoming a buyer's agent and I was a property solicitor for about 10 years. I've always loved property. Um, I probably got the bug when I was a little kid. I, I lived in England and um, every, every holiday my parents took me on holidays to, to France and uh, we, we just used to go and explore old barns and, and mm -hmm. anything that was for sale. My parent, parents were really into it so I, mm -hmm. I sort of got the bug from a very young age became a solicitor and specialized in property law uh, mm -hmm. because of my interest in property and then uh, moved over to, to Sydney uh, about 15 years ago or so now. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was uh, looking for a property for myself to buy. Mm -hmm. And I uh, started doing all the research, getting familiar with uh, all the areas, the suburbs, everything that I wanted to you know, check out and, and was interested in. Um, and at the same time, I had a whole load of friends and colleagues who were really interested in buying properties as well. Mm -hmm. So I started helping them and advising them on their property purchases. And I guess they came to me for two reasons. One, because of my property knowledge, yep. being a property lawyer. Yep. And two, because of my passion and, and interest in properties. Mm -hmm. So I started helping them out. And I, actually at that time, so this was about 12 years ago now, yep. I'd never even heard of a buyer's agent. So I actually fell into it completely by accident. Um, did a bit more research, found that there was something called a buyer's agent. Shortly after that, I, I went to work one day. I came home and I told my wife, my now wife, that I quit the job and uh, was going to become a buyer's agent. And uh, she was pretty shocked. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I took a big uh, plunge back then mm -hmm. um, and I've never really looked back. Okay, great. So, I mean, this is something we'll probably notice on the podcast. A lot of the buyer's agents that we do speak to haven't been doing it for six months or 12 months. I think that you need a lot of runs on the board for you actually to have seen enough properties to actually gone through the buying process a lot of times um, to really be, get good at it. You know, would you agree with that, Nick? It's, it's took you a, a number of years till you really got steam up. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's a lot of shortcuts into the industry. I mean, it's to be honest with you, uh, and this is something that I'm looking to bolster through my involvement with the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales. Yeah. But the barriers to industry aren't particularly high. Um, one of the shortcuts is, you know, you've been a selling agent for, you know, some period of time, uh, maybe as little as a year, maybe even less than that. You kind of prefer dealing with buyers. You're not really sure why, but then you think, oh, you might be more suited to being a buyer's agent and then you become a buyer's agent. Yeah. You know, that, that's very different, as you say, Chris, to having the runs on the board, um, coming from a different background, um, having worked actually as a property solicitor. Yeah. Uh, and you don't have to have worked as a property solicitor. Um, there's many areas and different avenues that you can come to buyers yeah. agency from, um, but that's my personal background. So having that little bit of extra really helps with the whole process and gives the clients confidence that you know actually what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's, it is important because, I mean, it's not just solicitors. It could be a builder. It could be a mortgage broker. It could be a property management. It could be you've been doing it just an investor. A lot of buyers agents were investors and then they became mm -hmm. buyers agents. So. But, you know, it is important when you add that on top of their experience of, say, you know, 10 years as a buyer's agent plus, you know, experience as a property plus, you know what I mean? There's a lot of years of, of knowledge banked up. The key, though, I think, though, is, is that experience being very similar experience or different experience. So have you been solely based in the inner west of Sydney for that last 10 years, been buying? Pretty much. Look, when I first went out, um, I didn't quite have the confidence to go out on my own entirely. So I actually worked uh, with a buyer's agency on the Lower North Shore for about yep. 12 months um, and gave that a crack. And at the time, we had a lot of clients in the Lower North Shore and the Eastern Suburbs. Yep. That's kind of where I cut my teeth. So I still do a lot of work in the Eastern Suburbs and the yep. Lower North Shore. And the demand for a buyer's agent, I mean, where do people come from that are most likely going to use a buyer's agent? In all honesty, it's the Inner West, the Eastern Suburbs and the Lower North Shore. Yep. Um, so I've got all those bases covered. Look, I've been you know, further afield. I seem to get a, a, a bit of a smattering from Balgaula to Manly because yeah. I think there's a natural progression maybe for, for certain inner West families when they've grown out of the two bedroom terrace to then want to upsize and, and get something bigger. Yeah. Uh, and a lot seem to end up in places like that. Yeah. But my core area, the bread and butter where I spend most of the time 
would be the inner west absolutely and i love the inner west uh, more than anywhere in sydney it's uh, <laughs> very passionate about yeah. it yeah cult fan here i mean the inner west um isn't without its challenges there's lots i mean geographically it's such an amazing spot when you look at it you know you're talking three four five six k's from the city um you know you've got beautiful kind of old heritage houses etc but it is a bit of a mishmash area so what are some of the challenges that you know you find for home buyers investing in the inner west that they don't know what they don't know that's a really good question, Chris. And I see a lot of people coming to the Inner West who really don't know and understand the area. It first hit me you know, nearly 10 years ago, actually, when I was working for an older couple and they were downsizing from a mansion in Roseville. Yep. And they were coming to the Inner West and they wanted to downsize. And I mean, this was kind of unheard of. They were mm. almost pioneers back then. Yep. They wanted to be closer to their kids who were in Marrickville. But it was a real eye-opener for me and I was really wanting to know why on earth would anyone who had a beautiful home in a prestigious suburb like Roseville mm. want to move to the inner west. So as you say, that it has a huge amount of broad appeal, uh, not just for young people, but even for downsizers. Yep. It's proximity to the city, facilities, amenities, shops, cinemas, transport, medical, health, um, universities, the lot, access to the, the CBD, the, the western side of the CBD. I mean, I even came on the, the light rail to a meeting in the city yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it was in the northern end of the city, but I got off at Piermont Bridge mm -hmm. and, and took a wonderful walk over Piermont Bay. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely fantastic. So it's really well located. In saying that, yeah. there are, as you say, a number of challenges with the inner west. Um, you know, you've got the flight path, you've got busy roads, you've got yeah. massive infrastructure changes going on right now with the West Connects. So I think I was just stop there for a sec. The, the, the flight path is the big one, right? Like, oh, it's not yeah. the biggest, but it is a big one. So but can we just talk a bit more about the flight path? Because there's a lot of misconceptions around flight paths. And I think, you know, someone on the ground that, you know, is constantly watching this has probably got a few good insights of how bad is it and where is it so what, you know, where is it really bad? Really good question. And look, I, I think I preface that by saying, look, if you're going to buy in the inner west, um, you know, a, unless you've got stacks of dough and you can get on the water in Balmain, um, you're going to have to cop something. You know, yeah. whether, it's, whether it's the flight path, whether it's some noise, shape or form from, from something or proximity to housing commission or boarding houses, you're probably going to have to cop something. Okay. So let's start with the flight path. I live actually in Leichhardt, not far from the flying path. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I, can say, I can say, you know, speaking uh, with a lot of experience about that, um, you know, when I came to Leichhardt in the beginning, I was a bit shocked at how low the, the planes were. Yep. Um, you've got to remember there is a curfew that is relatively strictly enforced yep. between 11 p.m. at night and 6 in the morning. So that's the first thing. If you think that you're going to be going through the night and you've got these planes just going one after the other yep. overhead, that's not actually the reality. But what so, about um, the flight paths? I mean, it's my understanding they might not always be fixed, right? The plane doesn't yeah. always just take this smooth trip <laughs> identical every time. Yeah. I mean, does the weather play into it? hundred percent. Absolutely. Yep. You know, look, I'll go through, through periods, you know, when I, I say to my wife, geez, I haven't heard a plane in about two months. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you get a change of weather uh, and, and you get more of a concentration of planes. Yep. Um, you can look at maps. There are maps online that you can find that show the main flight path and where you're going to get the highest concentration of planes. Yep. It actually does have, cover a huge area. Yep. I mean, there's other suburbs, like even Coogee cops a bit in the eastern suburbs. Yeah, even um, Rose Bay. And um, there's a line straight across over the eastern beaches. So it's not just the inner west. It's not just the inner west. Um, and I think the early, early morning flight, the, the London flight, I think it is, or the there is a couple before 6 a.m. that kind of somehow have negotiated away. But from my understanding, they, if they, you know, as long as the weather's fine, they come in from the south across Botany Bay. Is that your understanding? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So That's you don't get it across um, kind of the, the Dremoyne to the Roselle and Lilyfield, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, if we, you know, you're right, though. It's, it's not something that's um, all the way through the night. Western Sydney Airport, though, as an example, is going to be a 24-7 airport. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's even bigger consideration for what could happen out sure. there. Yeah. The other big one thing is the, the West Connects, which, you know, it's now we're starting to get to a point where we can actually see what's going to happen with it. Mm. But, you know, what are some of the big things that people just didn't know about that? And what are some of the things you've got to be careful of investing near that at the moment? Yeah, very good question. Um, I mean, it's been very divisive in the community. I mean, that, that's the first thing. But, um, 
you know, overall, uh, the idea is that it will massively uh, cut travel times. So that actually, if you, if you think about it from that perspective, is a massive bonus for the whole area. Um, I think one of the, well, the two biggest things, I suppose, for, for buyers is knowing where the tunnels are. Yep. Um, you don't really want to, to have a property or buy a property and then six months later find out that the tunnel is going to be straight under your property. Yeah. Uh, and then where the smokestacks are going to be. So in relation to the West Connect, most of that information is already available. Yeah. So you should be able to find that out on, on the internet and be able to research that. There's then the connection, which is the West uh, Harbour Link, I believe it's called the yep. West Harbour Link, uh, that goes under the Balmain Peninsula. That's not set in stone yet. So there's a, that's a little bit more up in the air. Yeah. But when it comes to the West Connects, you should be able to find out where the tunnels are. And you know, if you're gonna consider something in that area, I think it's really important to know how deep the tunnels are below the property. Yeah. Look, a lot of people will totally rule out even considering a property yeah. with a tunnel anywhere near. Yeah. You know, let's be clear. Um, but in saying that, that's now gonna cut out a lot of Roselle. Yeah. for example. Yeah. And Roselle is a good suburb close to the city. So we've gone through the advantages. Yeah. So you might actually have to reconsider Roselle. Yes, it's got tunnels. Let's find out how deep the tunnels are below the property and, yeah. and what's the, um, you know, what's underneath and, and how deep they are. Um, you know, it's a different scenario. I think there was a property in, in Haverfield that I heard about that was only 12 meters below the yeah. ground. Um, and, you know, you can imagine that would You'd almost imagine that you could feel that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Lanes of traffic, you know, 12 metres down. So the smokestack's um, a big thing, right? So, yeah. you know, it's it's not so much the tunnel underneath, it's where all the car fumes have got to come out somewhere. Yes. Um, we're not electric cars yet. Um, and that that's going to go, you know, come out. And there's a lot of concern around that. And it will rule out a lot of buyers. But, mm. you know, it's probably not a great place to invest anywhere near that. No. Um, but, you know, the tunnel is probably a bit different, right? Because it is such a tunnels are quite wide so you're going to have mm. the, you know a lot of properties that be ruled out a lot so of properties, yeah. if it's baked into the price and you're getting quite a big discount based on other things mm. that aren't in the tunnel mm. you might think that you know maybe it's over a bit over fear over that so i think there could be you yeah. know if it's sort of you know anything probably more than about 30 meters mm. below encased in rock mm. maybe you might need to consider that yep you know as i was saying it's very different if it's only 12 12 meters below but you know, yeah 30 meters or more encased in rock you know, how different is that? You know, you're thinking about something that's below you, but if you mapped out the same distance, you know, two blocks away, would it would it affect you in the same way? Yeah. You know, Parramatta Road's two blocks away. Well, it might it might still affect you. It, so you that's may a, still be bothered. But you good know, segue. Are... Um, the the main roads are another big thing. You know, yeah. in, in Newtown, like Parramatta Road, in, in not in western suburbs, inner west. You know, Parramatta Road's a busy road. Yeah. What are some of the other big things that you've got to be careful about the main roads there? Because they do get very clogged up and do get very busy. Yeah, and they've changed a bit. I'll, I'll be honest with you. With the um, opening of the first uh, stages of the West Connects, um, I'm noticing a few more rat runs locally, and I think that will change. Um, you know, the, the roads will go through a phase now. Of, some will be busier than others, and, and it's all about... Um, people working out the quickest routes. Yep. Um, you know, whilst we're in this interim phase where the West Connects hasn't been completely built. Um, so it's a good point that a lot of buyers don't, they look at the map, um, which is a good idea. I love that. You know, you go on the satellite, mm. you can have a look at the main roads. They always forget about this thing called a rat run. Um, mm. you, know, you know, and there's, you know, can you explain really what a rat run is and, you know, how you can catch you out well, I guess it's a local through thoroughfare um, that only really local traffic might go down. Um, but, you know, because of some road changes, it might see uh, increased traffic. And it might be able to handle a certain uh, increase. Well, I suppose that's why you've got to look at it from the beginning. Mm. You know, are you buying on a road? I mean, Johnson Street, Annandale, for example. Yeah. Um, I think, in, in a way, I shouldn't say so, I've got very good friends, people living... <laughs> you know, on, on Johnson Street, and yeah. but in a way, it is actually an underdeveloped road if you think about it. Yeah, I mean, it could yeah, potentially be a, a four lane highway, yeah, uh, and it isn't. So, I think when you're buying any property, you've got to think about what what might may end up in the future. You know, with Johnson Street, and can you tolerate it now? 
can you still tolerate the property 20, 30 years time if it's a major four lane highway? Yeah. So we've got the, you know, what are some of the other challenges in the West? Because I think it's one of those markets where, you know, a lot of um, buyers buy into the inner West and they haven't lived in the inner West before. You know, they've maybe lived in a, an apartment in Bondi, um, you know, they might be from another state. Um, and it's where it's affordable for a lot of young first home buyers. And so they're buying from, you know, and they're trying to apply the same thought process of buying somewhere else into the inner West. I feel like it can catch people out. Mm. So what are some of the things where buyers get to the inner West and they just don't know what they don't know? Like, you know, it could be soil contamination. That's a mm -hmm. big thing. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the other things? Yeah, absolutely. Well, a lot of things we've already discussed. I mean, it, it's such a colorful, vibrant area. Um, it, it's so very different from these other areas that, are, you know, in, in many ways are a lot more uniform. You come to the inner West, you're confronted by a lot of things. You know, you, you've got the flight path we've already discussed, the roads, uh, the tunnels, the infrastructure changes. Uh, you've got probably increased, you know, areas of housing commission that you might not be aware of. I mean, massive yeah. parts of even some great areas, you know, Glee, Balmain. Um, you know, if you're dropping a considerable amount of money, you might just really want to do your research up front to find out exactly what the neighbourhood is, is going to be like. I think the Housing Commission's a, a big one I've noticed. You know, there are pockets, you know, for example, like Glebe's a beautiful suburb, but, mm. you know, there, I think like there's two or three, there's a really A-grade part of Glebe where, yeah. you know, it's amazing, big wide terraces, there's B and then there's C and there's potentially even D where, mm. you know, it is, it is a bit sketchy sometimes. But, but, you know, those things do change. Um, right. I guess the, uh, you know, I guess in terms of, what you're seeing in the inner west now i, I feel from a um, young family point of view it's, it's highly desirable because it ticks a lot of their you know aspiring kind of affluent sort of mm -hmm. couples who mm -hmm. work in the city mm -hmm. they really look at the inner west but mm -hmm. what's your, what are you kind of seeing now what are some of the buy pools that are moving there and um what are they looking for yeah look at the moment i'm getting a lot of clients and a lot of inquiries from prospective clients who are you know young professional families um Probably with budgets, you know, sub two mil, um, you know, mid early ones, uh, and they're looking to really upgrade probably from a two bedroom unit to their first family home. They've got young kids. Yeah. Um, one of the factors we haven't discussed this yet, but the inner west is blessed with very very good public schools, uh, and that is a, a major draw card for young professional people who've got small kids. Uh, they're probably not at school yet um, in a lot of cases, but they're, they're doing their research. They want to get in early. They may want to buy in the right catchment zone mm. for the right school. Um, Is this high school as well as primary? I'm really focusing on primary at the moment. Yeah. Um, there's some, obviously some very good high schools as well. But really, uh, at the moment, I think the, um, the high concentration of mm. good public schools for, for primary schools really mm -hmm. uh, is a major draw card. Um, and, and particularly for those people who might be working in the CBD on the edge, uh, on the western edge of the, of the CBD, um, it might be yep. Piermont or it might be Barangaroo, mm -hmm. and they can easily hop on the light rail uh, and get into the city. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of buyers in that pool at the moment. So, you know, I find in the eastern suburbs, it's a little bit more of a protected species than the western suburbs and the inner west. Um, and the western suburbs even more so, I feel like the... You know, a lot of development just gets pushed through and there's a bit of a mishmash. But in the inner west, there is pretty good council controls. However, they are letting more apartments get built. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, then say potentially in the east, um, you know, where they probably put up a bit more of a fight. How is that kind of playing into the inner west and how is that changing the demographics and the shifts of certain postcodes and suburbs? Good question. I mean, I think it's more... Um you know, on a, on a sort of street by street or, or pocket basis. Mm. Um, you know, what we're seeing across the board is that, um, you know, the, uh, the the lack of interest from buyers now in modern apartments and off the, off the plan apartments, which is really a major catastrophe because yeah. the government was really um, trying to uh, increase supply uh, by promoting this uh, development of, of modern apartments. And it's massively backfired with uh, yeah. Opal and Mascot. Mascot's the bigger worry for me because that building there is about 10 years old. Yeah. So we can't even say that it's just very recent stuff and we can fix what's just happened recently. It goes back 10 years, possibly even longer. Um, but what you get in the inner west as well is those older style apartments, you know, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, even 80s blocks yeah. uh, that are solidly built, um, you know, and, and they're still appealing. 
yeah. um, and, uh, and all the terrace homes as well. Uh, so let's go there. So if you're mm. looking at the inner west and you're going like a young family, like what are the things that you, you know, if you go down the list of priorities where you're selecting one property over another, mm. what are the things that are must haves or are really desirables? And then, you know, I guess they've got to start there. Yeah, okay. So the young families, I mean, the first thing is probably they tend not to want strata. Yep. Um, they want their own house. Uh, if it's freestanding, all the better. Um, but it may end up being a, a terrace, depending on, or a semi, depending on budget. Um, the next thing, I suppose, is the um, the size of the property is really important. Uh, I mean, if they've got kids, they're going to want uh, you know something of a backyard. Mm -hmm. um, everything's relative, I suppose. And yeah. Again, dependent on budget, but um, you know, space is going to be really important. Uh, position of the property and location are going to be very important. Yeah. Um, we've already talked about schools. Um, you know, typically young families don't want to be on busy roads for yeah. health reasons, or they don't want their kids to be wandering around and accidentally, you know, on the path of a, of a busy road. So, and that's a big one, right? Concerns. Yeah. You know, a lot of buyers will just will be completely turned off. So when you go sell the property one yeah. day, you're basically ruling out a lot of buyers that would look at that. In a boom market, a lot of buyers sometimes just let it go and they'll buy and they'll they'll over overpay. But a lot of the main roads are the ones that got hit the hardest in a bit of a correction because buyers were like, I don't want to live on the main road. I'm going to go for the back street and the quieter street. So you've got to be extremely careful buying on the main roads. Exactly. But in terms of kind of the, the type of house, um, do you prefer things that have got a bit more character, um, things that are a bit more, um, you know, they're not building anymore? Is that what you really try to buy? Yeah, well, look, typically, and um, you're absolutely right, you know, the terrace houses close to the city, uh, you know, with all the character, the high ceilings, the cornices, the fireplaces. I mean, buyers are, are so much more attracted to these types of properties than, you know, something more vanilla and sterile and, and you know, arguably modern, but, um, you know, soulless and, and with no character. And, and, and that is a big factor. Um, that is actually a big factor. Uh, it's not just a matter of personal taste because the chances are it's going to, uh, it's going to meet everybody's personal taste. These properties tend to be more appealing. And because of that, uh, the prospect for capital growth tends to be a lot stronger than something that's a, a little bit more vanilla. I interesting point you made there around external and internal character, because I think that's sometimes missed. You know, people say it's a nice frontage, but when you get inside, is it stained glass windows? Is there, you know, nice fireplace, right. etc.? Yeah. All of these things, um, you know, a renovator's delight, right? That's yeah. the things that they... You know all the intricacies in the roof and things like that. So that's right. You know, it's, it's keep looking at those things. If you can find those things, and we're not producing any of them anymore, that's they're right. going to stay back. It's a finite what, supply of, of that type of property. Exactly. So, what are some of the deal breakers, though? Because you know, I feel like you should say no ninety nine times and then yes to a property, and so you should be ruling out most property because of a few reasons. They should just be deal breakers. So, what are some of the things that, you know, besides the busy road, what are some of the other things where you think? no way you should buy this property yeah that's a good question chris um i like to look um at you know some of the practices maybe of the banks um because that can govern a lot of buyer behavior uh, as you'd well know yeah um so often properties um so if we're looking at a house uh, at, at the lower end of, of, of pricing so we're probably looking at say 1.2 million dollar house in the inner west um, ideally, you don't want the property to be on a land size any any smaller than 100 square meters. Yeah. You know, you'll see one of my clients uh, pulled out a property in Surrey Hills that they thought they were interested in and sent me the details. It's on 59 square meters. Yeah, right. Um, now, yeah. look, sure, it's in Surrey Hills, but they happen to be a young family as well. Uh, so I just know that, uh, you know, it's just not viable. Is that because um, you just need a little bit of land for a backyard and some grass? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I feel like that's a big mistake sometimes I've seen, you know, client and investors make it because these are good investments as well, you know. Mm -hmm. The houses that suit families, the low ones, a lot of investors can stretch that far um, and get one quality asset. But sometimes they buy properties or houses that really don't suit families. Yeah. You know, they are a terrace, they are in Surrey Hills, but they've just got a tiny courtyard that's probably the size of this room we're in yeah. um, and it's just too small. That's right. So... You know, in terms of obviously a high, uh, high kind of supply of apartments and things like that, should mm -hmm. you go nowhere yeah, near absolutely. those? Don't touch any of that. No chance, etc. Yeah. Now, um, and with apartments, I mean, the size um, 
marker with, with apartments is typically 50 square meters actually. Yep. So similarly, we look at a land size for houses of 100 square meters. We try and get a minimum internal floor space area for an apartment, not excluding external areas and garage spacing of 50 square meters. Yeah. And so I mean, an example, of, you know, Kindy bought an amazing warehouse conversion, you know, last year with, with Nick, you know, yes, it's an apartment, but it's in an extremely unique building. Um, right. You can't get more unique than that. Uh, it's in one of the best streets in kind of that Newtown area, access to all the things that are changing in that area. So yes, it's an apartment, but it's an ultra scarce apartment that suits a certain vibe pool. And so, you know, be really careful when people say, I wouldn't buy an apartment. Um, there are amazing apartments, but there's also the vast majority um, great. In terms of, um, there's a real, stock shortage on the market right now. I think we mm. found out today that it's the lowest transactions at turnover in 20 years. Mm. Um, and it's even more amplified in the good areas for good property. So, you know, it's if you look at the median stats or the average stats, um, a lot of that's called poor stuff compared to the good stuff. Not like a boom, because a lot of the boom, you know, there's a lot more good stuff on the market. So in terms of actually getting the deal done, what are some mm. of the negotiation techniques once you've figured out what it's really worth, what are the ways that you get that signed contract with an agent? Really good question, Chris. I mean, I'd probably take it back to the beginning and um, really focus on what, what, what types of properties are we looking at for the, for the client? Mm. And are we going to be able to uh, add value and, uh, and get a good deal done on, on the right property? So the first thing I'd look at is, can I find an off-market property for this client? Mm. Now, off-market, you may have spoken about this before, but... Mm. Now, off market is one of those key buzzwords for, for buyers agents and agents generally. Um, and I think some buyers agents have a tendency of over promoting it because, of course, it sounds very appealing. You can say, oh, I've got stacks of access to stacks of off market properties. Yeah. The reality is very different. Um, you know, they say in Sydney every year about 10% of all properties are transacted off market. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about it, more than half of those are going to be between friends and family mm -hmm. um, and neighbours. So, um, and in tightly sought after suburbs close to the city, we're probably talking about less than 2% of all properties that are off market. Yeah. But in saying that, you know, look, my last four transactions have been off market. And in some years, more than 40% of all the deals yeah. I do are off market. So what we're saying there is that, you know, whilst I may discuss, you know, up to 50 properties with a client, may only be one off market property, but the chances of securing that off market property are even greater. Um, because there's no competition from other buyers. Yeah, and that's the speed, right? The you know the you're there, they want a quick deal. Yeah. You're willing to give. You can act. Correct. One of the things that you know I find with agents, they would much prefer to deal with a, a very experienced buyer's agent because the buyer's agents they're not wasting time. They value their own time. Um, they're not an average punch on the street that could be you know looking at properties and you know not be ready. Um, you've got you've got a buyer there ready to go. Otherwise, you wouldn't have them. And so, you know, from an agent, they'd much prefer to be dealing with a buyer's agent because there's a deal that's just waiting to happen. 100%. In terms of off-market though, there's a lot of misconceptions that, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the stuff on off-market isn't great. And that's mm -hmm. probably true. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stuff is overpriced, yeah. um, which is probably true. Yeah. But, you know, what are some of the other misconceptions on why someone would sell off the plan? Um, not because, it, just because not, they don't want too much money or it's not a great property. Yeah. Good property does sell. What are the reasons why they would go off market? Good question. Probably um, speed of, of doing the transaction. Yeah. Um, if you think about it from a vendor's point of view, if they're going to have to put a property on, onto the market uh, and it's going to be an auction campaign, uh, they may well have to wait four or five weeks for the auction. They've got to prepare the property. Uh, they've got to spend money up front. They've got to spend the money on the marketing up yeah. front. They usually spend that money up front. So if they don't have that time or they don't have that money up front and the agent's can tell the, the owner, well, I know a really good buyer's agent who's looking for this particular property. That's where you know the door the door becomes open. I'll give you a recent example, actually. Yeah. Um, so well, we could talk about. I mean, a client yeah. that you know Nick did buy for last year. I mean, do you want to talk through this? Not the actual client, but the you know in terms of they bought. You know, you found the property on the Monday, the Tuesday bought it, and the client wanted to buy the other one on the weekend. Yeah, yeah. Well, we do that all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, indeed. Um, the lot, I mean, the very last one I got was um, was one of these off-market properties, mm. where um, uh, and and you know the access to it was it was unusual in that the agents, so it's in the um, in a west in Newtown, big auction agent, mm -hmm. um, always loves 
you know, taking stuff to, to auction. Why would they sell anything off market? Well, I kept hounding him, I, I, you know, as I do when, I'm, when I've got a client ready to go. Uh, kept ringing him up, asking for a property that met the client's criteria. Have you got anything off market? And eventually, uh, he told me, shared me the, uh, with me the details of, of an off market property. Now, the um, story behind that one was that the vendor was a relatively high profile person in the, in the public domain. Didn't want anyone to know that uh, they were selling the property. And uh, as well, the property was tenanted. Uh, was a bit of a tricky tenant. They they were you know not not great on giving access. The property was poorly presented, so the agent knew that it was going to be hard work to to get this property onto yes. the open market and to take it to auction. Um, a when you've got a vendor who doesn't really want to go to auction and on the public uh, market, uh, and B when you've got a property that's tenanted. So that's where we got in. We were the only people to look at the property. Yeah. Uh, and we managed to secure that property in Erskineville for a really good price. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I actually reckon that uh, once we get to settlement and um, you know the, the client gets rid of the tenant, maybe paints it, spruces it up a little bit, they've already made $100,000. Yeah. Um, so that is just from really good property selection. Yeah, so I mean, they, buying a property with a tenant in it, you know, you rule out a lot of buyers because a lot of people want to move in. They don't want to wait six months. So, you know, when you're trying to sell a property, you don't really want to sell it with a tenant in it. Correct. You'd much rather get the tenant out, spruce it up, put some stylish furniture in it. But the reality is that takes time. And sometimes people, you know, death, divorce, you know, other cash flow needs, business needs, um, they just need to sell. And so, you know, that's probably a reason why you can sometimes be there from a speed. In terms of um, the negotiation, because I think, you know, search for a property is one part of it. You know, f f picking the right property is another part of it. You're getting a good asset. Um, valuing it is another mm. real skill. Mm. But even if you know what it's worth, actually getting that signed contract, I think is probably one of the most difficult things. What are some of the tricks that you use to, you know, when it is a hot property, to get it and get that signed contract? Yeah, really good question. Well, I like to know all the background up front. Um, I like to know who's selling the property, why they're selling the property, um, have they already bought yet? You know, really getting to, to understand the motivation of the vendors, because then you can put your, uh, your, your head in their, in their space and, and work out really what they want and what, what appeals to them as well. Sometimes you'd be surprised, but it isn't always price. Um, so that is really important. So that's um, a good point here. So, you know, generally speaking, when someone's selling an asset, if it's a home, they've got to move to something else. Mm. And so there's a, usually a, a painful experience that they probably want to avoid. And so, you know, the terms of a contract and the terms of the deal, they would say it doesn't matter, but when the good mm. offer comes in, it's mm. pretty good. That's right. And then the terms are a little bit sweeter. They sometimes in their head think the terms are more important than the price. Um, and you know, it might be easy. So what are some of the things you can do with terms Absolutely. just to like, maybe win that deal? Absolutely. Well, it's really important to find out if the, if the um, vendors have bought a property yet because then you can work out, well, if they have, then they may be motivated to get the deal done really quickly. They may be struggling to, for finance. They may need bridging finance. But if we can uh, come in quickly uh, and, and offer a shorter settlement period, I mean, if our clients... Uh, need finance, then we wouldn't want to shorten it probably for less than four weeks. But yeah. we could we could offer a four week settlement period, um, and that may make it more appealing for a vendor in that scenario. Yeah, and I've had clients buy in less than four weeks. You know, yeah. it's not to say you can't do it. Yeah. Um, if speed is the number one factor that's going to get you the property, yeah. um, there are lenders that we can use that are more likely going to be able to turn things around extremely fast. And just so for our listeners, you know, in terms of speed around turning stuff around at lenders. Every week and every year, it's getting better. Um, digital docs, e-signing, um, you know, in-house solicitors. So speed's going to be getting easier and easier. So if you do get the right property, sometimes shortening out to four weeks or even shorter can win you the deal. Yeah. But what about if if longer settlements and lease That's dates? Right. Absolutely. Well, conversely, maybe the opposite scenario: the the vendor uh, may be inclined to sell, but they may be a bit concerned that they haven't already found the property that they want to move to. So you might need to offer them, or it might be uh, desirable or advisable to offer them a, sh a longer settlement period. Um, and I've had ones that are, have even gone for up to six months. 
um, you know, to win the vendor over and, and to get the property at a good price. At least and that tax. gives, um, well, the first thing is, yeah, you could do a longer settlement and that gives the vendor the opportunity to just stay in the property until the settlement period. Or yes, as you say, Chris, you could do a lease back, which is where the vendor sells the property, you get to settlement, but then the buyer um, then uh, leases the property to the vendor. So the vendor actually remains in occupation of the property, um, but by virtue of having a lease. I've seen that work time and time again, where you know the good thing for the seller is they get their money. Mm. So it's like you know they've got their money in their six weeks, and they've got a contract to stay for up to say six months on a week to week yeah. basis. Yeah. Um, and as soon as they buy a property, then they're going to move out, and then you can move in as a buyer. And if you've got the flexibility on the buy side, then it can definitely win the deal. But let's say the vendor just wants the most money; they don't care about terms. They're happy with forty-two days. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of get that deal done though, you know, in terms of, and they're not sure, they don't care whether they go to auction or not go to auction. Mm -hmm. They consider a deal, but how do you get the real estate agent to take your offer? Well, look, that's a really good question. And at the end of the day, look, there will be some properties where we'll try everything, but at the end of the day, it just has to go to auction. I mean, there, there are some circumstances where a property actually has to go to auction. It might be a deceased estate, yep. it might be instructions from the solicitors, uh, some sort of settlement, it actually has to go to, to, to auction. Um, in other instances, vendors may be uh, absolutely, um, you know, firm on, on having to take the property to auction. Um, in all other circumstances, though, I will do my utmost, particularly in a market like this we have at the moment, where there's a lot of buyer interest, uh, to do what we can to secure a property for a good price before the auction. Um, and, you know, timing is critical. Um, when you're doing that. So, uh, you know, number one, you've got to get through the property. If you can be one of the first people through the property, then really that's going to put you at the front of the queue, just from a timing point of view. So it's obvious. You're in a mental sort of, you know, the agent's probably already putting you as a key buyer if you're that's interested, right. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I start working on the agent from the beginning um, and letting them know, you know, little bits of, of, about my, my client, why we're interested in the property. But really working on that relationship with the agent. I've got great relationships with, uh, you know, pretty much all the agents in the inner west. Um, and that's not to say we don't get our own way and we don't get the properties for, for good prices. But when you've got a good relationship with a selling agent, it's really important because it means that they're more likely to want my client to end up with the property and they're more likely to want to share the information with me and my clients about Know, various things. Um, how much interest is there on the property? How many other buyers are interested in the property? How many other buyers have requested a copy of the contract? How many other buyers have done a building and test inspection? All this information uh, is going to be able to put you in a better frame of mind than the other buyers uh, and assess your, your chances for, for success and, and where you should be price-wise um, to be able to secure the property at a good price. Yeah, I think that you know, one of the biggest things is having that relationship and it's not the same just going through the process and going to six or seven properties and meeting them six or seven times. Like that is strong. At the end of the day, they see you as a buyer. They're not thinking a long-term relationship. Really, they know you're not going to buy the property another 10 years time. Mm -hmm. Every agent would say that they were, you know, they look after their buyer's interests, you know, and they do look after the vendor's interests. But it's different when you, you know, you are dealing with them week in, week out, and you're going to see them next week. That's right. Um, they do want to do the right thing by you a, a bit, and they are invested in the relationship because Nick's been buying in that area, say, for eight years. Nick's ten years. Not, yeah, well, 10 years, you know, and so in 10 years' time, Nick probably will still be buying in the area. So, yeah. you know, there's, there's a relationship there, and they are going to get calls. If I'm a selling agent, I'm going to call Nick first, really. You know, I'm not going to go through my database. I've got a property that needs speed. I'm going to call someone who can give me a client with speed, you know. So, um, in terms of the things where you add the value where, you know, I find like sometimes a lot of clients are hesitant on using buyer's agents um, because, you know, they might have a bit of an overconfidence bias. They think they can do it themselves. Um, there's a bit fearful that they're going to spend money and it's not going to be worth it. But what are the, the things where you think you add the most, like add value where a lot of the customers you take on don't know you add that value until they've gone through the experience? Really good question, yeah. And, and I mean, it's two things really. It's property selection. And it goes back to how we found the property. And, um, you know, I will always prioritize a property that's a bit more low key, off market, or, or the marketing isn't quite there compared to something where everyone seems to be interested in this property. Um, look, if my client absolutely wants that property, yeah, sure, we'll give it a crack. Um, 
but you know, if they're an investor or, or they're a bit indifferent, um, then from my point of view, there is very little point in getting sucked in to the circus that is an overinflated auction campaign on a particular property, you know, that may be guiding, uh, you know, say one five, uh, and it ends up selling for two mil. Um, you know, and if we can see that from the beginning, um, and as well, if, if they get a le little bit extra out of the, the price in the end, you know, maybe we looked at the property and we think, well, yeah, one seven, it might be a good value. Um, but if we can assess really that it's even going to go above that and, and that was the budget, then there's very little point wasting all, all that time on focusing on that property. And I think that's the trap for a lot of buyers because I think what happens is, um, you know, they don't have as much time as we do as buyers. Agents. I work six days a week. I work really hard getting through as many properties that I can to put all of my clients in the best position uh, on, on each of the properties that may be of interest to them. The problem for buyers is that, you know, they've got far less time. They've got scraps of time, you know, maybe on a Saturday. They'll look at one or two properties. They may be interested in one of those. Um, it may be going for auction in four weeks' time. They put all their eggs in that one basket. They wait four weeks and they miss out in four weeks' time. They've only got to do that 12 times and a whole year's gone by. Yeah, um, it's really interesting. So, it's, it, but it happens. Um, I find that most clients will go through this experience. Um, you know, there's a... They'll go out to the market. They'll be hit by the underquoting problem. Virtually, they just didn't expect things to go for so much, um, and especially the stuff that you know it's underquoted. But it's actually a better pro. Like the comparables the agents using really aren't really comparables. It's a much better street. It's north facing, etc. But you know they could say that it's a similar land size and it's in a similar suburb, but it's just they're not the same property. And when they go to auction, it just shoots over right yeah, absolutely so, absolutely you know like you can't say the agent's doing the wrong thing there but you know that is a problem i think um you know potentially not understanding what you really want to achieve and whether it's actually achievable um you know i think that's a problem that people get a bit overconfident they want the three bed the two living spaces the parking um the good street the north facing light all for one six but mm. you know in the last two years there's been one property that's sold for that and you yeah. just don't know why that property sold for one six. It could have been, you know, a fire sale because they had to get a good deal. So yeah. I think that's where I think a lot of buyers agents had a lot of value. They can really say, look, what you want for that, you're going to need to spend X and can you afford it or do you want to? That's right. Um, so, you know, I think what if they say, um, you know, everyone wants the three bed renovated good street. Mm. What are some of the good little investing strategies where the market all wants this but you can kind of get into the inner west and buy this knowing that it's a good investment long term. Good question. Well, one is it, you know, one of those really good off market properties where the price is genuine is yeah. a genuinely good price. I mean, that's, that's you know, one of the options. Um, the other is yes, everyone wants a three bedroom house. Are there two bedroom houses that we're overlooking that may have the potential to very easily or down the track to add a third room or maybe go up into the roof space? A lot of pitfalls there, of course. So you wouldn't want to buy a property and then think that you can add a third bedroom and not be able to do that. So you've got to do your research really well. As buyers agents, we know what the questions are. I mean, we haven't always got the right answers, but we certainly know what the right questions are and the right people to ask the right questions to. So, of course, that is really going to help. I'd say now as well, the, the properties that most people are, are really um, uh, flocking to are the ones that have had a, a, an ultra nice, you know, modern renovation done. You know, it's, it's all about the, the touchy feely stuff, you know, the great fixtures and finishings. <laughs> um, and, and really, um, you know, if we look at the property, you know, two doors down, that doesn't have those same level of finishes, but we can get it at a much better price and then still put our own finish and even choose our own finishes it, yeah. ourselves. Um, then of course, you know, we'd be far better off pursuing the property uh, that's a bit more low key at a much better price. Yeah, so I buying the two bedroom house that can convert to a three bed or a four bed sometimes um, with a two adding an extra bathroom and an ensuite, etc. Um, for me, I think that's one of the best strategies from an investment point of view um, because I think your purchase price is much lower, um, your rent doesn't drop as as much. Um, you still get a young professional couple to rent it rather than a family, and you know similarly. You get a reasonable, you know, similar rent, but your purchase price is much lower. So your yield is generally much better. 
um, but also the growth doesn't usually get hit too much because long term, when you want to sell it one day or your neighbor sells, they're selling it to a family and that family will do a reno on it. Um, and so you, and you, and you generally own a good portion of the land. And so I think, you know, it's definitely something to consider. Um, but you have to be really careful that you can convert it to a three bed, you know, mm-hmm. you need to know what to ask, mm-hmm. who to check, what council to call, right. etc. Don't, don't assume, don't assume the neighbor's done it so I can do it. Yeah. Um, Cause they you, may have done it at a time in the past when it was allowed and, and now it's no longer allowed. Yeah. And so you just gotta be really careful. So do you get experts like architects in and yep. builders in when you've got those challenges? Absolutely. I mean, one of the most important things we do is organize the building and pest inspection. Um, you know, I, I've got a really good relationship with the building and, and pest inspector that a lot of my clients use, obviously. Um, and I actually, uh, where I can, I mean, I can't always be in two places at once, obviously, but where I can, I actually attend the building and pest yeah. inspection with the inspector. Uh, buyers can do that. Uh, don't, you don't just have to be a buyer's agent to, to do that. You know, just yeah. if, if you're not using a buyer's agent and you want to know more about the property, attend the, the, the inspection with the building and, and pest inspector. Great um, advice. They, they give you so much more detail about all the issues. Um, one of the biggest problems you'll, you'll find with people buying property for the first time is that they'll read the building and pest inspection reports and be totally put off and rule the property out. Yeah. Uh, and then you know they miss out on the property and then they end up going for another property. They may even not bother with the building and pest inspection on the yeah. second one because of the you know, the, the uh, mem- memories and the bad experience with the first one. But, you know, that, that is the, the wrong way to play it. Um, the building and pest inspection is designed to show all the negatives with the property, all the problems. And, you know, the perfect property has never been built. Every property has problems. Yeah. So it's about assessing uh, how bad those pr- uh, problems are and how much they're likely to, to going to be to, to fix um, dollars-wise. Yeah, um, I've and seen getting this. that information from the, the building inspector. Yeah, I have seen this a lot of times with buyers as well. And, um, you know, it's all in love with the property, um, which is not a great idea. But, you know, and then the building and pest comes um, and there are problems. But there's always problems, right? And then it's about ranking those problems. How important are they? How big are they? How much of an unknown there are? Can you afford to fix it? Do you need to fix it now or later? It's, It's a lot of discussions. And I think you do need someone there to to go, you know, have it, I think cut through to the builders, a great idea. Mm-hmm. A lot of the builders probably won't give you that real inside information unless you've got a relationship there. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, you know, they want to protect themselves. They've got, a, you know, a lot of writing on there. They can't, you know, the liability if they say the wrong mm-hmm. thing, et cetera. So, mm-hmm. but having a relationship there. In terms of, you know, final question though, but in terms of the inner west, like what are some of the, you know, gentrification is happening dramatically there. But how are the thing, the city kind of, how is it gentrifying and people, you know, a bit thinking that it's just you know, all families are moving there, et cetera. But what are some areas where you're really finding that they're dramatically shifting and changing at the moment? Just pick, you know, one suburb as an example. Yeah, good question. I mean, I think that whole Newtown area is, um, I mean, we've, it's not the first time we've mentioned Newtown today, um, uh, but it is becoming increasingly popular with a wide variety of people. I mean, it's, it's always been a vibrant area and I don't really think that it's losing anything of that characteristic, but it is appealing more and more to young families and, and downsizers um, and, and you know, maybe people with a bit more money too. So the properties over time are being renovated. Um, and when we talk about Newtown, it's, it's that whole patch, Newtown, Enmore, Erskineville, uh, Camperdown, yeah. um, Alexandria, um, you know, that whole inner city patch. One of the things that I would say, though, is that there are pockets um, that, you know, at any given time perform differently to, to other pockets. Um, and right now, we're in a bit more of a, a crazy home buyer's market, if you like. So and I'm not going to give the game away, but there might be pockets where traditionally they may be a bit more of an investor grade suburb, um, but actually, uh, they they could have uh, universal appeal for home buyers as well, but they may be slightly overlooked because of some previous connotations with the suburbs. Um, You're know, saying places like Redfern, maybe, maybe, yeah. Um, I won't uh, <laughs> go too far, but um, I mean, let's go there for just for a second. Yeah, the new metro that's coming into um, in Redfern. I think this is a 
you are thinking about buying a home. I mean, I've lived in London before uh, for four years. I think you know you don't own a car. You get the the tube everywhere, right? And um, you know, I think Sydney is potentially going to get a transport system over the next twenty to thirty years. Mm. That will will have will basically give you those options, right? Mm. Uh, and the metro is really the start of that. Yeah. But you know, I guess talk talk our listeners through a bit about that new metro and how that's going to potentially really shift the suburbs of kind of Alexandria, Waterloo, um, Redfern. Well, there's you know, a massive amount of uh, infrastructure and investment that's going into uh, you know, Waterloo for the, um, uh, for the metro. I mean, we've, we've seen it in other suburbs previously. So you know, why is it going to be any different in, in Waterloo? It's, it's not. Um, you know, you look at the suburb of Marrickville, uh, massive amount of investment and, and close to the rail, railway station, which is where the metro is going to go. Um, other places like Crow's Nest, they've already seen the, the uplift in value. Yep. Um, so, you know, you look at places like Redfern and Waterloo, and they're already so close to the city. Um, I mean, you could actually walk to the city from there. Yeah. Um, you've got the light rail going in as well. Um, you've got a, a planned um, upgrade to Central Station, um, you know, which is another big bonus for, for anything within that reach of, of that sort of area and infrastructure yeah so i think those areas are, are very exciting very exciting and the light rail thing which isn't technically uh redford but it's more yeah. in the surrey hills pocket yeah um what's your thoughts on where surrey hills is at because i feel like it's had a bit of a uh identity crisis um with the light rail yeah. kind of killing the vibe i guess yeah. but um, so do you, do you yeah. feel like it's coming back I think it'll come back because if you think about it, it's it's really the uh, the main suburb where you're going to have the the light rail going through the streets. You compare it to Melbourne, you compare it to cities in Europe, exciting, vibrant cities. I mean, I live in Leichhardt. Uh, you know, a lot of people wouldn't know that back in the uh, old days, the original tram network used to actually go down Norden Street or Marion Street, and uh, it, it's a shame almost today that the light rail doesn't still do that because if you look at some of the shops that are uh, struggling you know, from a retail perspective, uh, bringing the light rail through would have a massive impact. You'd, you'd have people coming to the shops yeah. more from na- neighbouring suburbs like Lewisham and Dulwich Hill just to spend time and, and go to the shops in Leichhardt. So, of course, we're going to see that in, in yeah. Surrey Hills. Absolutely. Yeah, and the new stadium is going to happen. Um, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it, I mean, people, whether you hate it or you don't, um, you know, that that is that whole Surrey area is Paddington. Yeah. You know, it's it's becoming more and more desirable to many different buyer pools. And I think that's the, the big thing here is to know that the suburbs are shifting and Newtown's a great example of that. Mm. A lot of families would not want to go anywhere near King Street. No. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of beautiful houses there, great parks, great community. Mm-hmm. Why don't we look at Newtown? If 100%. it's a bit more affordable than, yeah. you know, Balmain or Annandale, Surrey Hills, Hills etc. So thank you, Nick. So this is um, you know another example of kind of when you're looking to get a, um, you know, buy a property, you definitely need to speak to some buyers agents. Uh, and Nick's great in the inner west and obviously other parts of Sydney, but, you know, he's based in Leichhardt, but he's um, you know, bought all over. So thanks for coming on, Nick. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Thank you.